On Monday the 22nd of July 1987, 25-year-old Wendy Nell said goodnight to her boyfriend and went to her flat in Guildford Road, Tunbridge Wells, Kent, UK. This was the last time she was seen alive. She was murdered later that evening. On Tuesday, November the 24th, 1987, 20-year-old Caroline Pierce took a taxi to her basement flat in Grosvenor Park, Tunbridge Wells, and was not seen alive again. Her body was found dumped 40 miles away a month later. This is Azra Kamal, who tragically died in a terrible accident at the age of 24 in July 2020. However, if this was not horrific enough, the man who killed Wendy and Caroline violated her body after her death, and she was not the only one. He did this to at least a hundred corpses of women and children. This is the man responsible for these offences, David Fuller, aka the Morgue Monster, and his crimes will shock and appall you. Welcome to Evil Among Us. In 1987, Kent police were dealing with the double murder of two women in extremely similar circumstances. At some point during the night of Monday the 22nd of July 1987, an unidentified man broke into the flat of Wendy Nell, beat her, seriously sexually assaulted her and strangled her to death. Concerned work colleagues and her boyfriend contacted police the next day and found her window open and her body on the bed. A significant amount of blood was found in the property, showing she had bled profusely during her final moments alive. Five months later, in December 1987, the body of a woman was found in a field in St Mary in the Marsh, approximately 40 miles from Tunbridge Wells. She had been seriously sexually assaulted and strangled to death. The body was identified as being Caroline Pierce, who had gone missing from her basement flat the month before. On the night she disappeared, screams were heard by her neighbours. These two crimes became known as the bedsit murders, but despite extensive investigations, no suspect was identified and the case eventually went cold. Advanced in DNA testing meant the police forces were revisiting cold cases, sometimes decades old, in order to try and identify suspects. This analysis linked the killer of Wendy Nell and Caroline Pierce, but this did not match anyone on the national database. However, by 2019, there had been the emergence of familial DNA searches, whereby the police were able to compare the DNA to known offenders who were on the database for similarities, which would suggest the unknown offender was a relative. From there, they would then focus on the family and take samples of all males to see if any of them were an exact match. The closest match was Fuller's brother, whose DNA was added to the police database in 2012, and this fact and further inquiries led the police to Fuller's door. Morning. Oh, David, it's the place. Hello. Jeremy, it's coming to speak to you. Oh, yes, come. Are you here alone? No, no. Yes, I'm here. Just a third question. Right, just get up there. Thank you. Thank you. David, if you listen to what I'm going to say. Yes. Um, we're from Kent Police and we're investigating the murders of Wendy Nell and Caroline Pierce in 1987. Okay? <laughs> As part of that investigation, you've been linked as a suspect, both geographically and forensically. Okay, if you listen to what my colleagues are going to say to you. Alright, David, you're under arrest on suspicion of the murders of Wendy Nell and Caroline Pierce in 1987. Do you understand? Yes. You do not have to say anything, but it may harm your defence if you do not mention, when questioned, something which you later on in court. Anything you do say may be given in evidence. You are being arrested to secure and preserve evidence by means of questioning so we can conduct searches so forensic samples can be attained and to prevent your disappearance. As an aside, I always find these murder arrest videos really fascinating as they show an individual's last moments of freedom as they basically go straight to the police station then to court and then sit in prison until their trial or their sentence and then, if convicted, serve their time which could be 15 years, 20 years or the rest of their lives I wonder what Fuller was doing on his last day of freedom, what he had planned for the next day, and whether he knew that the walls had finally closed in around him. Anyway, as if the murder of two women was not egregious enough, police searched Fuller's property and found hard drives clearly hidden from view. What police would find on Fuller's hard drives was, in some ways, 
just as bad or even worse than the crimes they were arresting him for. It's important at this stage to outline a key detail about Fuller and his employment. Specifically, between 1989 and his arrest in 2020, he worked as a maintenance man in hospital, which gave him access to areas of the hospital usually out of bounds to most people, including the morgues. Fuller used this access to sexually abuse corpses and record these acts. Police found a complex filing system on Fuller's computer, where he had documented and catalogued his sickening denigration of these corpses. They found 800,000 images and 504 videos on one hard drive alone, and, from this material, they were able to identify that he had sexually abused at least 102 dead bodies between 2008 and 2020, including just two days before his eventual arrest. The youngest corpse that Fuller violated was that of a nine-year-old girl, but he also engaged in sexual acts with the body of a 100-year-old woman. Videos were found of Fuller placing his genitals inside the mouths, anuses and vaginas of the dead bodies. He also used his tongue and fingers to penetrate them. He abused some corpses repeatedly over a number of days. Sometimes he sexually assaulted the bodies prior to their autopsies, sometimes afterwards. He abused the bodies of those who had passed away from natural causes, those who were killed in tragic accidents, and some that had taken their own lives. He also abused corpses of people from the same family. He abused bodies which were laid out ready for autopsy or for viewing by relatives, but others he removed from the fridges or took them out of body bags. He posed them and placed them in different positions to take photographs and videos. Fuller copied the mortuary records to identify the names of the corpses he violated and would catalogue these trophies as well as searching for his victims on social media. This behaviour, as well as viewing the videos and photographs, was clearly a way for him to relive his sickening behaviour over and over again for his perverse sexual gratification. One of the bodies Fuller abused was that of 24-year-old Azra Kamal, who died tragically at night on the 16th of July 2020, when her car caught fire and she was trying to flee. However, in the darkness, she mistook a barrier as being that of the central reservation and instead did not realise that it was the outer edge of the carriageway, and she plummeted to her death. As if the distress of having your daughter taken away so cruelly and at such a young age was not bad enough, her mother, Nevres Kamal, had to be told by police that her daughter had been assaulted by Fuller on multiple occasions after her death. I'm about to play a video of part of an interview with Nevres about what happened to her daughter and how it affected her, which is distressing. However, I want to point out the bravery of this woman and her composure. If someone did this to my loved one, I'm not sure I'd be able to string a sentence together, let alone be so eloquent and strong. I had spent two wonderful hours in the mortuary um, sleeping with her and that gave me some sort of comfort. Little did I know that my daughter had been violated prior to that day and in the evening of that day. So whilst I'm stroking my daughter's hair, sleeping on her hair, A man had crawled all over her skin and there's me kissing and cuddling and saying my last goodbyes. And that's quite awful, quite awful. However, um, it is not Azra's shame, it is not my shame. Maybe some would just bury their heads in the sand and not want to know any more detail, but you've actively kind of sought out the facts. You wanted to know how long. Yes. When did he come in? Yes. What access did he have? Yes. You found all of that out already. Yes. And I tell you why, Jay, Jason, is that if you allow, for me personally, if you allow yourself to wonder what if, what happened, how could it have happened, how long, what did that person do? We spend a lot of time and energy creating confusion and pain in your mind. For me to have facts, I can focus on those facts and I can focus my energy on that. And I will never bury my head in any sand and nor would have Azra. I've thought long and hard about this interview and I know that Azra would be asking me, tell the story. So you do have the detail and you do know the shocking thing seems to be that he had access for 20 minutes, half an hour. Well, I'll give you the details, Jason. 
the first time was 13 minutes, the second time was 15 minutes, and the day that I visited Azra and spent quality time, and my last time with Azra was for 35 minutes. This first video shows the moment that Fuller confessed to his evil crimes during his police interview. Notice his cowardly demeanour compared to that of Neverez, with him hunched over, barely making eye contact, and trying to avoid actually verbalising the horrific things he had done. The second clip is looking at an obvious question in this case, and that is how Fuller was able to get away with this for so long. Was it always in the evenings, David? Was it always evening time? Yes. Yeah. Okay. How we, we know that... I want to admit that I am admitting the offences, but I don't really want to go into detail. Yeah. No. Okay. I appreciate that. And what offences are you admitting, David? As you've just described to me. Okay. In terms of the sexual penetration yes. of corpses? Okay. Do you know why you started? No. The second part to this, David, is the recording, isn't it? Of, of what's been happening. Okay. We'll have to go through that in a little bit more detail, but just for now, David. All right. Just for now. All right. When, when that's been happening. Okay. All right. Have, have you been recording yourself doing those things? Recording yourself sexually penetrating the corpses. I admit that. Yeah. Okay. Did you record their names? Yes. Okay. Did you record their ages? Yes. Okay. Why did you record what was going on? I don't know why. What did you retain the recordings for? I don't know, either. Okay. Was it for further sexual pleasure, David? Yeah, in, in the same way as somebody would keep pornography or mm -hmm. things like that? Was it for further sexual pleasure? To understand this, Neveris asked the NHS Trust for a map of the mortuary. She learned that David Fuller had swipe card access because he sometimes did maintenance work there and that he knew staff went home at 4pm. Porters might still visit the receiving area delivering bodies, but the same fridges had doors opening onto the post-mortem area where Fuller committed his crimes. Here there was no CCTV until recently and the fridge doors were unlocked. Fuller gained access through the utility rooms, but he still passed cameras en route and needed to swipe in. Despite the lack of CCTV cameras, I think the question still remains how someone did not notice what this man was doing. Reports state that he went into the mortuary on thousands of occasions. Surely someone must have been keeping a log of maintenance work in the building and question why, when there were no reported faults, he kept going in there. It also does not appear that his contact with the bodies was brief, so how did no one see him or catch him when he would spend significant time posing and abusing the bodies? On the 15th of December 2021 at Maystone Crown Court, Fuller appeared for sentencing for the murders of Wendy Nell and Caroline Pierce, as well as 51 other offences related to the sexual abuse of corpses. He had pleaded guilty to all charges the week before. During this hearing, the extent of his depravity was fully exposed. Also contained on Fuller's hard drives were images of murdered and sexually abused women and children. There was a large number of indecent images of children, some as young as two years old, being forced to commit sexual acts with men, it was clear that Fuller not only had an obsession with sex, but any acts of violation related to children and women, with him appearing to be drawn to acts that caused them pain, distress and degradation. With regards to the two women he murdered, it was unclear but considered likely that he committed sexual acts on them after they were deceased. Fuller was then made subject to a whole life order, an extremely rare sentence in the UK, meaning that he will never be released from prison. He's currently incarcerated at HMP Franklin's, a Category A prison which holds some of the worst and most dangerous offenders in the country. However, the story doesn't end there. 
In December 2022, Fuller was again in court for sentence after pleading guilty to further sexual acts related to 23 corpses. He was given a further four years custody. However, I wish to close this part of the video by including a portion of the sentencing hearing and how the judge described Fuller's crimes. There is a settled process by which the court reaches sentence. I must assess the degree of your responsibility, establish the harm caused, and consider aggravating and mitigating features. There is no sentencing guideline for sexual penetration of a corpse or for possessing extreme pornography. The maximum sentence for both offences is two years imprisonment. In my judgment, each of these offences was of high culpability, all of them the highest possible blameworthiness. The offences committed in the mortuaries involved an astonishing breach of trust and invasion of privacy, which was repeated so much that it became habitual. The dead bodies of women were used for your sexual gratification. Each was recorded and some were further manipulated when reduced to di digital images. The mortuary offences were also of the highest category of harm, as the impact statements the court has heard have testified. You have no regard for the dignity of the dead. Women who had recently died were attacked at a time when they were utterly alone and unable to resist or report your exploitation. As you well knew, those who cared for them were mourning their loss at the very time you were abusing them. There are numerous aggravating features obvious in the description of what you did. The location, the repetition, the abuse of position, the utter degradation of those recently living human beings, and in particular, the multiplicity of victims. There is no mitigation. I have seen no evidence of genuine remorse as opposed to hollow regret now that you are under public scrutiny. It is clear that David Fuller was a committed necrophile and it will likely take years of analysis by people much cleverer than me to understand his crimes and how his sexual beliefs developed. However, I want to have a go at it. So here are my thoughts on David Fuller and how his offending potentially progressed. Firstly, I think that it's important to point out that Fuller wasn't only interested in dead bodies, but he appeared to also have a sexual interest in acts on living women and children, with these revolving around violence and a lack of consent. I believe this demonstrates that he had an overall desire to engage in acts which degraded women and children, using their bodies any way he wanted, both before and after they died. This behaviour, I think, would have given him a great sense of power, which was likely in contrast to his general demeanour, which appears outwardly to be quiet and somewhat introverted how his interest in this type of behavior developed is not clear but it is apparent that he'd been a ticking time bomb for most of his life the murders of wendy now and caroline pierce were clearly not impulsive acts and were likely planned out and were the culmination of years of fantasies the fact that the judge believed that he may have had intercourse with their bodies after death suggests that potentially his whole aim was to kill these women in order to abuse their bodies after they had died. However, to the best of our knowledge, Fuller did not kill again, which is unusual, but I believe explainable and shows his level of cunning. Potentially, Fuller found the act of murder too risky and laborious, including cleaning up the crime scene, etc., and weighed up his options as to how he could indulge his sick sexual desires without risking being caught. So, he researched jobs which would bring him into contact with dead bodies on a regular basis, I have little doubt that the reason why Fuller got the job in the hospital in 1989, a year after the murders, was to gain access to corpses to abuse. I also don't believe for a minute that Fuller's behaviour only started in 2008 and stopped in 2020, and think it is likely that he had been doing this for decades. Based on this, the number of corpses he violated could be in the thousands. Whether he did in fact commit more murders is unclear at the current time, but I would not be surprised if the name of David Fuller is not in the news again in the future. So, what are your thoughts? How long do you think Fuller was committing offences against corpses for? Why do you think he did it? Do you think he's killed more than the two people we know about? Drop your comments below, I look forward to reading them and I'll reply where I can. 
Please like and subscribe and click the bell for notifications of when I post new videos, which is twice a week. Take care and I'll see you in the next video.